Uh, these guys are also on the CM team. Um, I'll let them introduce themselves. No? <laughs> no? Okay, it's working. Yeah. Uh, my name is probably unpronounceable to most of you. Um, I'm Portuguese, so my name is Ricardo Sequeira. I usually go by just my initials, RC. I'm Chris. Uh, I handle a lot of the infrastructure for Signage and Mod. I've been involved in the project for a long time. I'm just going to go ahead and warn you guys. One of my things when I'm doing stuff like this is if people are taking pictures of me, I will take a picture of you. <laughs> this might look kind of funny. Um, yeah, and pass it on. I'm uh, not on right now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Brent Cribble. I normally go by Beckett. I'm a device maintainer for a few of the devices in CM. All right, so I kind of want to start off talk and talk about where CM fits into the Android landscape because there's two very distinct sides. So let's, uh, let's just get started there. So now we all know that Android is open, right? We all say Android's open. In fact, it's so open that it's kind of twisted the definition of open. Android runs on top of Linux, right? So everyone knows that Linux is licensed under the GPL, get new public license. So if you make changes to the Linux kernel, you have to release those changes to your users, right? So now the Android platform, it's licensed completely differently. It uses the Apache license. So you can copy that. You can modify it, redistribute it, and you have no obligation to make any of your changes available to anybody at all. The only thing that you have to do under the Apache license is make sure that you preserve the notices and attributions that are in any source code or in any text files or whatever that comes with the source code that you've downloaded. So pretty much anybody can go and just download the Android source from Google's Git servers for free, compile it, use it to build a phone or a tablet. Can make ch if, if they make changes to the Linux kernel, okay, they have to open those up. But if they make changes to Android to suit their device, they're theirs, thanks to the Apache license. Nothing else they have to do. So, you know, that's, that's pretty great if you're trying to build a phone or a tablet. You know, you can use whatever you want, but, um, you know, if you want to just go and download it and you want to play around with it yourself for mere mortals, right? Well, what are you going to do with it? What are you going to run it on? So, well, there's a couple of things you can do. Um, <laughs> well, you can build the emulator. I mean, but, I mean, how fun is the emulator? I mean, it's pretty crappy to begin with. But, I mean, it's, it's gotten better. All right, if there's anybody here from Google. But, um, <laughs> um, but it's, it's still not the greatest thing in the world. Well, you can build your own phone, right? So let's build a phone, right? Um, I mean, that's great, but um, that's not in the realm of things that most of us can do. Um, well, maybe you just want to install Android on the phone you have. You know, maybe you think that, um, you know, there's something that, that pisses you off about the way it works that you want to just go ahead and change, you know, or, you know, you just want to play around with it and see how it works because you think the code's cool. Well, it's open, right? You should be able to do that. Well, this is kind of where that word open starts to uh, get a little bit fuzzy. So we like to think of what we call Android as a, as a piece of software. But really, what everybody else thinks of it as, it's a combination of hardware and software. So how many people here have actually, how many people here have actually downloaded Android? and compiled it. All right, sweet, all right. <laughs> all right, All right. so you know it's got support for a couple of devices. Um, you can build it for Google's Nexus phones. Sort of for the Motorola Zoom, sort of. And um, I think the G1 is supported up until like Froyo. So these devices are Google's flagship devices. They're the Google Experience devices. They're designed to be what Google thinks Android should be. And they're designed to set an example for 
manufacturers that want to use Android to create their own devices. So the really great thing about these phones is that you can just get them, you can compile Android, you can install Android on it. You know, they have, um, un they're unlockable, you can install whatever you want on them, no problem. So Google's gone, they've released this insane massive amount of code anybody can download. And given the resources, they can build a device if they want. And in doing so, they've totally disrupted the entire mobile industry. I mean, all the companies that were these great mobile giants, they're basically burning carcasses at this point. And it's because all this technology that was once considered totally proprietary, it's just open. Anybody can use it. It's totally available. It's easy. It's anybody who wants to use it. So, of course, you have a business plan behind that, and that's advertising, licensing, proprietary services. But, you know, we're not going to delve too deep into that right now. But if you just want to build Android, it's open, right? You should be able to just build it. Well, this is where things start to get a little bit, a little bit fuzzy. Yeah, even more fuzzy. <laughs> well, in the real world, hardware manufacturers are really in an incredibly competitive environment. So suddenly, they all have this code base that they can work on, and they have this huge need to differentiate their devices. They need to stand out. They need to be immediately recognizable. So they start building new features. They change the look and feel. They start adding all these third-party apps that you may or may not want. So they're free to use anything they want. They can use any trade secrets, proprietary technology, whatever. There's no requirement for them to release any code other than the Linux kernel because of the way Android is licensed. It's pretty beautiful, actually. Um, you know, Google's really accomplished their goal there. The bad part is that with these devices, other than the Google phones, the Nexus phones, is that even if you could build your own OS for them, you can't easily install it. The bootloader stops you from doing that. You need a cryptographic signature from the manufacturer to install the software on the hardware that you bought. So basically what you have is something that's totally proprietary. It's not open. It's pretty much the opposite of open. You paid quite a bit of money for it. All right, well, in defense of these manufacturers, all the competition and the accelerated rate of development that Android's enabled, it's really pushed the state of the art forward. It's why there's a new device that comes out every month that has another core, or it has another gig of RAM, or it has, you know, whatever super feature from the future. Um, I mean, these software innovations are really pushing the state of art, the state of the art forward, and they are—they're shaping mobile and they're shaping the future of Android. But so, where does where does CM fit into this, and where does the user fit into this? So, you, the, we all have the code to Android. We all have the same code that these guys are building off of. All right, so. Here's a little story. So when, <laughs> when I first got the G1, I, I think I got it on launch day, um, I knew a little bit about Android. I hadn't really done much mobile stuff. In fact, I've done no mobile stuff at that point. I knew it ran Linux. And I was pretty intrigued by that. So like the good Gen 2 user I was at the time, I immediately wanted to build the entire OS from scratch myself. Well, that was actually possible. And it was doable. And there were a ton of other people doing the same thing. And um, there was a pretty great community that was kind of rising out of the ashes of Windows Mobile on XDA developers. So everybody there was kind of playing off of each other's work and you know, remixing it and building new, bigger things and working from source code. Maybe not working from source code, but um, really great things are coming out of it. So I kind of got involved in that. 
I decided to put one of my builds up there one day, and the response just blew me away. Um, it was really good. Um, in like 24 hours, uh, there were like 5,000 posts on the thread that I started, and um, it was really motivating. So two years later, uh, here we are, and um, the same ROM has two and a half million users and uh, hundreds of people contributing to it from all over the world. So I'm incredibly excited about that. Um, so what is CM? What is CyanogenMod? So I call it an Android distribution. Just like Ubuntu or Gentoo are distributions of Linux for commodity desktop hardware, CM is a distribution of Android for commodity smartphones and tablets. Right? There's no difference. They're still computers, right? So it's meant to bridge the gap between the open spirit of Android and the stuff that you can actually buy today. Since we, not many people in this room can go out and build their own hardware. Right now, it's available for something like 100 shipping devices. And these are just the things that we support. Um, there's way more than that that you know, maybe have one or two features that aren't quite perfect, but you can still compile them yourself if you want. So it doesn't include any bloatware. None of these little third-party apps that the uh, that the manufacturers think are so valuable. And you know, of course, they're making them tons of money, but um, for most of us, we don't need them. It's fast. It's got lots of great features, and the best thing is that you can. Make it do anything you want. You can customize it. You can modify it. So it's really made for developers and advanced users. But more recently, we've kind of gotten away from the, uh, the feature creep and really focused on what we think is the best parts of what we have. And we really want to deliver a really great experience when you install CM. So in that respect, it's pretty mom friendly. I'd have my mom run it. I would. <laughs> oh, yeah? <laughs> well, the best thing about CM is uh, the community that's kind of sprung up around it. Um, I mean, we have a few hundred people here, and that's awesome. That's more people than I've ever spoken for before. <laughs> um, we have two and a half million users. That's unique users. These are. And, and, and these are unique devices. These aren't just people that wiped their phone and reinstalled it. These are actually unique devices. And these are actually just the people that have chosen to opt into the stats reporting. And that's freaking awesome. I, I, it totally blows my mind. I had no idea that it was going to end up something like this. I mean, it's like we all just do this for fun. I mean, this is kind of like... Uh, we kind of consider this like a little like niche project that we just do for fun, but I mean, you know, we just do it in our spare time, and you know, suddenly, you know, we, we actually have what we, what you what a lot of people would call market share, right? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> two and a half million users is a pretty decent number, right? Yeah. All right, so here's a. Uh, Here's a graph of uh, the number of devices that we actually have official support for that you can just go to our download and uh, that you can just go and download. Um, so it's somewhere around, what, 89? And that's, that doesn't include all the devices that we actually have support for that you could actually compile for. That's not all the targets you can compile for. These are just all the devices that, that we think are ready for you to use. And, we think everything works, and you know you're not going to have a problem and want to smash it on the ground because you installed some custom ROM and something doesn't work, and or GPS leaves you off a cliff or something. So, <laughs> all right. So, um, this is uh, the number of uh, users that we're adding every day. Um, right now, it's something like it's not, it, it's something like twelve thousand new users a day. <laughs> I don't even know what to say to that. <laughs> All 
All right, so, so why would you want to use this? Well, maybe you're a control freak like the rest of us, and uh, you want to have complete control of the device that you paid for, and you paid quite a bit of money for. Um, you know, this includes root access to the device. And this enables a whole new realm of apps that, that, that you can create. Now, we use the latest release of Android when we're building CM. CM9 is based on Android 4.0.4. CM7 is still based on Gingerbread. Um, but we're trying to move everything forward. We do nightly builds. So if you want, you can get a new build every day. And a lot of people do. And based on our stats, we have half a million users that just use nightlies. So that's pretty good. Uh, there's tons of cool features. There's a theme engine, so you can turn your phone pink or purple with one of RC's themes. Um, <laughs> we have a lock screen with widgets, T9 dollar, custom launcher. Um, there's tons of little features that you'll find in there that you know are just like, oh well, that's awesome. That's why didn't I think of that? Um, so, also, it's open source, so there's no surprises. So you're not going to find any secret software that's running in the background that's capturing your keystrokes and sending them off to some remote server. And if there were, we'd give you the source code for it. <laughs> so for developers, I think most of us are developers in this room here. So if you're not using CM, you really need to be using CM. The biggest reason why is because since you have the exact source code to the firmware that's running on your device, if you're running an app that you're having problems with, you can actually debug that app all the way down to the bare metal. I mean, you can debug it down to the kernel layer if you're that crazy. I mean, this is, this is, this is really great. I mean, I have, on every Android project I've worked on, I've probably found at least one bug in the framework itself. And um, it's, it's pretty maddening. And being able to do this and actually know what's going on, see what's happening, it's, it's, it's kind of necessary. Um, and it's also, you also learn a lot when you do it. And if you're working in native code, it's really the only way to do it. And that kind of brings us around to the real reason for doing all this, is that if there's something that you don't like, you can just change it, right? So maybe it's just like, something in the UI that you don't like. You know, maybe like there's a, a cancel and an OK button that are swap, right? And you don't like that. Well, I mean, you can just change it. Super easy. You can just load the entire platform into Eclipse, change it, install it on your device, and see the change right away. Super easy. And you don't need to buy a special device. I mean, if you want to get under carrier subsidy, I mean, sure, if you want to do that, you can. Um, but hopefully, if you do make some of these cool changes, um, you'll contribute it back and everybody can benefit from it. So there's a lot of stuff to do. Um, you know, it's not perfect. Um, there's a lot of stuff that I would like to see added to it. But it kind of keeps me motivated. And it's a lot of fun to work on. It's a lot of fun to... Uh, to, uh, to see your work go out to so many people. And that's really why I, uh, I do what I do, because I can get it in the hands of so many people so easily. And uh, you know, if you've ever worked on a project where you, know, you did a bunch of work and it got canned, I mean, it's pretty, it's, it's pretty miserable. <laughs> Nobody wants to do that. This, this is the total opposite of that. It's awesome. Yeah, so our goal is really to take all this great hardware that these companies like Samsung and HTC and Sony Ericsson are making and crack it open and kind of bring back some of the open spirit that Android is really all about and make it work the way we want. All right, so, so how do we do this? So, going to get a little bit technical, but not too technical. 
I just kind of want to talk about some of the some of the things that that we have to do to 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 port Android to a new device. Now this is this is the same thing that a manufacturer would do. We're not doing anything different. So Android, it's not like Windows or Ubuntu or any other desktop OS. You can't just get Android and install it and think that it's going to work because it's pretty much the opposite of that. I mean, this is th this is designed for um, a, a a limited device, although these devices aren't really limited anymore. Um, but there's no there's no magic drivers that load in the background or anything like that. Um, the entire OS is totally customized specifically for the hardware that it's running on, and the hardware is moving insanely fast. In every month, there's you know another core, more RAM, whatever. So it's really not uncommon for a manufacturer to release a dozen devices in you know a span of like three months, and a lot of the times they're exactly the same with some minor variations. But really, when you look inside, they're just variations um, on common system on a chip platforms, right? So they're all running things like Qualcomm Snapdragon or TI's OMAP, Exynos or Tegra. So. What a manufacturer is going to do when they're designing one of these devices is they're going to start with, with one of these platforms, um, you know, based on the specifications and requirements that they have. So the final product that you're going to buy might be totally locked down. The chipset manufacturer that they originally based a product on, they sell development kits that you can just go and buy. You can buy a Dragon board, or you can buy a Panda board you know, with an OMAP chipset, or you can buy an Origin board. Right, and the chipset vendor they also make the code open source because they're pretty much founded on the concept of engineering, and you know they want to they really want to sell great hardware and see it used. So they're also open sourcing most of the code, at least enough to get it up and running and and and, and work with it. So what we do in CM, we have a whole bunch of different devices to support all the way across the spectrum. So what we do is we take this code for these reference platforms and we merge it together. So there's lots of um, if defing and other barriers and things like that that we do. But once it's all together, um, it's usually the case where if we can get one device in that class of devices up and running, it usually means that we'll be able to get maybe a dozen others running. So pretty often, if you follow CM uh, device support or anything like that, you'll see one device come up. Like you saw um, recently, we did uh, like the, uh, the Samsung Skyrocket. And um, you know, also like the Hercules and the Galaxy Note, like all at the same time, because we got the chipset support for that family of devices going. So plus the chipset support. The manufacturers have to supply the source code for the Linux kernel. So once we have those, we can usually at least get a device booting. It might not work very well, but at least we can get it booting and we can take it from there. So we have a good foundation to start with. So if someone decides to port CM to a new device, what do they have to do? Well, there's a whole bunch of subsystems beyond this chipset support, kernel support, that needs to work. So Linux is kind of running the show. So you have the source code to Linux. And most of the subsystems are pretty straightforward. So touch screens, input, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, they're all standard Linux stuff. There's not really any magic there. Maybe there, there, there might be some some, some difference in kernel versions that comes into play, but for, for the most part, that's pretty straightforward. Now, Android has a hardware abstraction layer. What it's designed to do is provide a common interface between the framework and the hardware. So the how, it's not perfect. Um, the how is very immature. Um, the how basically supports the vendors that Google's worked with. So when 
other manufacturers are trying to build their hardware, what happens is they just hack the hell out of it and do whatever they want. They extend the hell, modify the framework, whatever they got to do to get their stuff working. So that's, that's actually great, and it's kind of driving things forward. You know, new versions of Android support things like composition bypass and all these features that, you know, certain vendors have, have introduced to support their particular platforms to make them fast. Well, you know, it's all pushing everything forward. Uh, just one note about this um, regarding the, the halls and the, the mm -hmm. fact that vendors keep extending them. This is <laughs> actually a, a ended up generating a feedback loop in which <laughs> Google is taking some of the modifications yes. that the vendors and the, the, the silicon manufacturers are doing and integrating it back into Android. Yes. And one of the main reasons that ICS now is being um, a bit more troublesome than usual to get running on, on the families of devices we support is because the shift between Android 2.3 and Android 4.0 uh, includes a lot of this kind of work by Google. Mm -hmm. They are doing a lot of extension <coughs> and adding extensibility to the, uh, the hardware abstraction layer in order to facilitate, facilitate these hardware manufacturers to do their own magic stuffs in the devices they do. Yeah, so even though they're hacking the heck out of Android, you know, they, they're really pushing Android forward too. So it, it really is a combination of hardware and software. You know, it's not just, it's not just software like, like we think it is. So, but fortunately for, for our purposes, most of these high-level limitations, you know, with things like graphics, basic audio, um, if you get the, ra the reference platform code, it's available. So you have something at least basic to start with. So... Let's um let's kind of go through a couple of things that uh that we have to deal with in order to uh to get to get something running. So number one is going to be graphics. Now, GPU drivers for things like Adreno and Mali, um, they're totally proprietary. Um, unless you work for the manufacturer of that hardware, um, you know, like Qualcomm, you you'll never see that code. Even if you, even if you work for Samsung or Sony Ericsson, you'll still never see that code. They are, you know, these are their graphics drivers. That's it. And on top of the GPU, now these are limited systems, so they need to do some clever things in order to make everything nice and fast. So what you see on most of these devices are what we call an overlay engine. And what the overlay engine does is it can take video from some other chip on the device and display it right on the screen, all right? Like the camera app is going to do that, or playing back video. Or it could do hardware display composition. And this is a big thing in ICS, is that what vendors are doing is they are getting information from the hardware abstraction layer and then deciding how to render the display. So they're not just sending it to the GPU to render it. What they're doing is they're splitting it up, figuring out exactly what's on the screen, and maybe sending it down these special pipes to this special overlay engine. Now, the overlay engine, it's got all these weird restrictions. Like, it's not just going to take like a regular RGB buffer. It's got to be in some weird format. Um, you know, maybe it can't handle rotation. Um, there's going to be all kinds of limitations on it. But when it works, it works really well. And they try and make it work really well for the, for the best case. So. A lot of this is voodoo. Um, <laughs> uh, so the graphics code that you see in CM, it's pretty much identical to the reference code that we're going to get from a chipset vendor. Um, but what's painful for us is that the user space code is going to be tied very tightly to the kernel. It's also going to be tied tightly to the hardware revision and capabilities. So it takes us a little bit of time to figure out exactly what works. Um, and because of the tight coupling, often um, we'll get code from like the kernel drop from the manufacturer, we'll have ancient code from like six months ago where the device uh, or the chipset vendor is, you know, shipping zero day stuff and they have this really, you know, this, this really amazing way of doing stuff. 
but you can't exactly use it because kernel code doesn't match. So you have to go in, and in most cases, what we do is you know, we'll pull in the newest code and figure out exactly what needs to be there, update you know, everything else that goes along with the, those subsystems and make it all work and try and get the latest and greatest going. All right, so number two, um, my favorite thing is audio. Um, so if you haven't noticed, your phone has lots of different inputs and outputs. Um, you have multiple microphones, um, multiple speakers, uh, noise, noise and echo cancellation uh, hardware chips that are dedicated to that. Uh, some devices have digital signal processors, um, Beats Audio, whatever. Um, there's aux inputs and outputs. There might be Bluetooth. Um, well, there's definitely going to be Bluetooth. <laughs> um, so basic audio routing functionality, it's, it's handled. Uh, it, Android takes care of most of it. If you're going to switch from a call to music, it can do that. Now, if it's going to switch from a call with echo cancellation to music over Bluetooth, maybe it can't do that so well. So the reference code usually contains basic stuff that runs on top of Android that handles that policy on how to switch things. It also handles the things like talking to the hardware itself because it's pretty non-standard. In a lot of cases, um, there, um, the, the, the interface to the audio hardware, it's not, it's not also. It's not anything that you think that it is. It's actually calling out to a separate chip or separate processor, doing remote procedure calls, you know, crazy stuff in order to do things just like to change the volume. Um, I mean, you're starting to see it also happen more often, but it's not the it's not the standard case. It's but hopefully we'll see more of that, and you know the 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 the, the chips will be built more up to open standards. But if we don't do it right, you know maybe your Bluetooth headphones won't work. Um, maybe if you call your mom, it's going to sound like you're underwater, and um, you know that's not very usable. If your phone can't be a phone and do the things it has to do, it's pretty useless, right? So we have to make sure all this stuff works. So we have to go in and take the code that is supplied in the reference platform that's supplied in Android. We have to make all that audio routing work. Um, and we have to figure out what the manufacturer did to, you know, make, to, to make it work to begin with. So cameras and media. Um, so these are pretty nice to have. Um, and they always rely on dedicated hardware. So there's dedicated hardware that handles media encoding and encoding on all your phones, all your tablets. And um, it's usually a separate piece of hardware running its own little OS that you'll never get to see the inside of. Fortunately, um, there's, a, there's a, an API called OpenMax that bridges to hardware encoders from software that wants to talk to them. Now, it's, it's available for most systems, but this is another place where, like the how, it gets extended like crazy and hacked into bits in order to get good performance. Maybe you need to get data from one device to another in a special way, like they might be sharing memory. So you don't want to have to copy that data from, from, you know, from one memory segment to the other that would just kill your frame rate. So it needs to take into account all of those circumstances. So um, you see a lot of changes in the framework because of that. But it's pretty straightforward. Um, like cameras, cameras are painful. Cameras are the hardest thing that we have to deal with in CM. And um, if we're going to call a device stable and it has a camera, the camera should work. So. Uh, the drivers for cameras, they're never open source. Um, and the biggest problem is that the abstraction between the camera hardware and Android sucks. In ICS, it got that much better, but it's still pretty awful. And the problem is, is that because of this, the camera driver itself depends on internal parts of Android, and those parts change with every release. So they might they might depend on 
um, the, you know, some internal memory allocator inside of Android. They might depend on how Android passes native windows around from one application to the other. Um, and there's no way for us to easily fix that. Now, there's a couple of cases where we've created wrappers for these things, or we've, uh, you know, RC's created some camera wrappers. Um, or for some older devices, we've totally in reverse engineered the drivers and gotten those working. But, you know, it's, it's pretty guaranteed that if we try and take a device from one version of Android to the next, and try and use those old camera drivers, they never work. They will never work. They never have worked, even once that I can think of. So in that case, we're kind of at the mercy of the vendor to hopefully get us updated drivers. And fortunately, there has been one vendor that's actually worked with us on this. Uh, that was actually Sony Ericsson. They actually built drivers specifically without their proprietary stuff for a new version of Android for us. And that's how we have like nearly perfect support for Sony Ericsson devices. So last but not least is the cell radio and GPS hardware, which are the most important things in the device you carry around in your pocket every day. Well, they're black boxes. There's no, we, we have no visibility into these things. So in radio hardware, it's actually a dedicated standalone processor. Just kind of does its own thing. Usually it runs a real-time operating system. And the only way that you can talk to it is over like a remote procedure call, like RPC type mechanism. It's the only visibility you have into it. So Android, fortunately, provides radio interface layer. And there's two sides to this. There's a Java side, and there's a native side. So the real lets the Java side talk to the native side. But Google isn't exactly a cellular carrier type company. So they're kind of relying on these vendors to define the specs. So they go absolutely crazy with it in um, shipping devices. And sometimes it's totally different. You know, if you have a, if, if you have a Galaxy S2 for T-Mobile and a Galaxy S2 for AT&T, the low level code is totally different. But the good thing about the rail is that it's pretty well defined on the job side. And it's pretty debuggable. You can see when things are failing. So what we've done is we've taken the rail. We know we need to adapt it for multiple vendors. We figured out the problems that something like a Qualcomm device that's on HTC versus some Sony Ericsson device or um, you know some TI device. Um, so we subclass the real, and we have all the little different tweaks for the different carriers, vendors, device combinations, whatever. We load that up at runtime, and it works. And it doesn't affect other devices. It's a pretty good solution. <laughs> so, all right, so now, hypothetically, we've made all this hardware work, but there's something that may or may not have stood in our way from the beginning, and that's a bootloader lock. So from the perspective of someone who's trying to make these things work and do things that they're not supposed to do, um, the bootloader lock is our worst enemy. So this is a security measure, I guess, that <laughs> it requires a cryptographic signature on the firmware. So the bootloader has some special key, and it needs to authenticate the firmware. And the only way that you can flash firmware on a locked device is if it's signed by the manufacturer's key. Well, this is pretty horrible. And if you want to install CM, you need to be able to install unsigned firmware, period. There's no other way to do it. So the, the situation is kind of getting better, but it's still pretty bad. Um, so devices that are, there's quite a few devices out there that are pretty much impenetrable. And um, they actually will do things like verify the code at runtime 
So even if you actually manage to get the code on there, it won't execute it. Uh, Motorola. Um, so these are the, the devices with the worst CM support. So if you want to run CM, don't buy these devices. In fact, don't buy them at all. Um, so there's lots of other devices out there that are pretty much wide open. Um, they let you modify the things that you need to do um, or that, that you would actually want to modify, and they kind of get it. Um, and so these are the devices we have the best CM support for. So there's some that are kind of in the middle, like HTC, that sort of let you unlock some, but not others. And then there's some like the Nexus phones that are kind of the best of both worlds that um, let you, they actually let you lock it, and they let you unlock it, and, and relock it. And when you unlock it, it actually wipes your phone, right? So if I stole RC's phone from his bag, and I had no way to get in there. And I thought, oh, I can just fast boot OEM unlock and get the data. Well, it's actually going to wipe the device. So I can't get anything from it. But when you unlock it and you go ahead and install a custom ROM, you can actually unlock it. Or I'm sorry, you can relock it afterwards. So you can resecure it and sort of enforce that again. And um, depending on the way that you flash the firmware, you can still do signature checking and all that, and it's still pretty secure. I mean, it's really the best system, and I wish all the vendors would pick it up, but um, you know, it's kind of a kind of an uphill battle. So, like, none of these protection schemes have actually lasted the test of time at all. Um, all of them have been cracked. Um, there are some notable Motorola devices that. You know, they, they actually stop code execution and not just flashing. So that's kind of a, you know, a really crazy level of protection that nobody else is doing. Um, so now, none of us are really involved in actually breaking bootloader uh, protection schemes. But um, when it happens, we're not exactly sad because it means that we, suddenly, we, we now have access to a new device that we can run CM on. All right, so what other crap do we have to deal with? Um, <laughs> um, uh, there's a lot of proprietary code. Um, I'm not, I'm not going to say that we're super open source and you know everything's been reverse engineered and everything's happy and shiny, but um, there's, there's a lot of proprietary code. It usually revolves around the radio subsystem. Um, so if you download CM, or more, more if you want to build CM, what you'll need to do is you'll need to plug in your device, you'll need to run a script that pulls a handful of files from the device and um, uses them during the build. Um, and, you know, these are going to be the, the binary blobs, you know, that we call them. Um, you know, they're kind of needed to build a working system. This is going to be the, the, the OpenGL drivers, you know, stuff for the radio. Um, we, we try to exclude everything that we can, but unfortunately, it's just the way things are. And if you want to run your own OS, then this is what you have to deal with. Um, another issue is that now the manufacturers are releasing kernel code, but it's a mess. Um, they don't actually release the actual code that they use to build the device. Um, it's been scrubbed down. Um, you know, comments are removed from the code. Make sure that you know there's nothing that's you know reveals their internal development process. Totally cool, makes sense. Um, but at the same time, what usually happens is that they strip out all support for any other devices. So if you download a kernel for Galaxy S2 on AT&T, it probably doesn't support anything else. If you download a kernel for the HTC sensation, unless HTC made a mistake and left code in for another device, um, it's only going to support the HTC sensation. Nothing else. Even though during their internal process it supported 20 other devices, they've deleted all that. And there's there's no change log. It's really just a tarball of a bunch of code, no identifying information. 
So since there's a lot of advices in the same family, what we try to do is we try to take the code and we try and combine it together. Um, so um, in CM, maybe you'll see a, a kernel that can be used on like five or six different devices. They're all similar, same chipset family, um, same manufacturer. But we put it back together. And that, that's actually how the manufacturer probably had it to begin with. But they made it difficult for us. We fixed it. So now when a new version of Android comes out, um, like probably Jelly Bean this week, hopefully, um, <laughs> It's insanely difficult for us to integrate. And this is a problem that every manufacturer faces. And that's why it takes so long for you to get an upgrade from one, oh, from one version of Android to another, even if you're running stock. It's because Google writes too much freaking code. Um, like the releases are huge. And nobody knows what's actually in them. When, when ICS came out, it was even worse for us because we didn't have the source code for Honeycomb. So we pretty much started over. Um, you know, we, we, we couldn't upgrade CM7 to ICS. It was, it was too hard. We had customized CM7, CM7 so much that merging ICS into it, it was just impossible. We, it just, we couldn't do it. And on top of that, I mean, they took a lot of our features. <laughs> there, was, there was a lot of stuff that we didn't even need to do. So you know, we were happy. So, um, <laughs> I mean, so, I mean, we started over. We reevaluated everything. It was good for us because, you know, we, we ended up with a better product because of it. So the last issue, and this is, this is really frustrating if you, if you contribute to CM and you um, you find issues in Android itself, maybe, or you know, even if you're just working on Android as a you know as a non-CM person, is that um, there's no visibility into what's coming next. None. No idea what's coming. Everything's kept closed until Google decides to release it. So they just open everything all at once and. Here you go. So sometimes maybe we'll find a bug and you know in stage fright or we'll find some rendering bug or whatever. We'll upload the fix to to the uh, AOSP code review system, and then they'll say, "Oh well, we already did this. Yeah, it's already done. It's in some magic internal branch that you can't see, so we can't merge it, and you can't even get it out there to the people that are working off of." AOSP master branch because they're not going to merge it because they have it in some magic branch inside. And don't even think about trying to upload a feature because if it's not on the roadmap, it's totally pointless to even try. It'll just sit there. Nobody will even look at it. And, you know, if you if you bump it enough times, maybe you'll get an ask to reply or something. But, um, you know, new features, you know, you'll from an, as an outsider, you'll never get them in. So, um, you know, you're better off just submitting them to CM, honestly. I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty frustrating. So I mean, we, have, we have a lot of challenges to overcome. Um, I mean, Android's open, but it's not exactly the friendly kind of open. <laughs> All right, so, and that's the technical side. So um, internally, um, you know, we, we run our project a lot differently from most open source projects that you that you see. Um, so we have a core team, um, and uh, we have a public relations team, and we also have device maintainer teams. So the core team consists of a handful of guys, myself, Cardo, Chris, um, and a few other guys. Um, our job is we keep the infrastructure going, we make the policies, set the direction for the project, we merge all the incoming patches, and we try to keep everybody else coordinated. And we do other things too, but um, as leaders of CM, that's what we try to do. Herding cats. Yes, herding cats. Now, we have a PR team. Um, it's headed up by AppSec uh, DevCoda, Swirl. Uh, his team 
Uh, ma they maintain the forums, the website. They write all the documentation on our wiki. They do the release announcements. They handle bug reports. They manage our social network presence. And basically, they do all the things engineers don't do and will never do, and they suck at. And um, <laughs> these guys are, you know, Swirl's way better than you <laughs> at doing these kind of things. <laughs> So we also have the device maintainer teams. And these are the guys that make CM work. They do all the porting work. They're the ones that are interested in taking a device and bringing it from stock to CM, opening it up. And we have a whole bunch of these teams. Sometimes it's just one person. Sometimes it's 20 people working on one device. Um, every team. They handle a device. Sometimes they handle family devices. Sometimes there's, right now I think we have, you know, there, there's, there's one team that's doing uh, all the international Samsung devices. We have a team that's doing um, most of the Samsung tablets. We have teams that are doing US Samsung devices. We have guys that are doing all the LG devices. We have, uh, we have guys that are doing all the Sony Ericsson devices. So there's all these little subgroups inside of, inside of CM. And they, um, we, don't, we don't try and make them work any specific way. So whatever works for them. Um, if they want to work in secret until everything's ready, you know, if that works for them, let them do it. Um, you know, this whole, this whole sort of modding community, it's kind of, it's kind of uh, competitive. And, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's 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 tough when everybody is trying to use everybody else's work and bring something out there, and everybody wants to get their name known. And um, so, whatever, if it works, that's how it's going to work. So, a roadmap doesn't really exist. Um, <laughs> you know, we have. Um, we have uh, some ideas about where we want to see CM go, and we sort of set some, some, some leadership and some goals. Maybe we have um, some ideas for the app. Um, you know, a couple of weeks ago, I wrote all these features that I wanted to see in our camera app. Um, but, you know, in reality, it's just kind of when it's ready. Um, you know, we're really just a bunch of volunteers. I mean, we're not a business. We're not here to make money. Um, we're doing it because we think that it's necessary. You know, maybe that's a little cocky, but um, we think it's necessary to sort of maintain, maintain the balance between users and everybody else, right? So, I mean, it's a lot of fun, too. I mean, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun to pick up one of these devices and port Android to it and see it work and figure out all the internals of it and... Um, you know, just uh, and also get it out to all these people that are anxious to use it. I mean, we're spending a lot of free time on this, and I mean, we don't really want any more stress in our lives. So, you know, when it's ready. <laughs> um, now, past these main teams, um, we have, I don't even know the number. I mean, there's probably in the hundreds now of people that just contribute code. And really, this is where all of the cool stuff that you see in CM comes from. Like, it's not on a roadmap. It's, you know, nobody really has it in mind. It's just, you know, somebody is taking a shower one day and they have a great idea and they sit down and decide to code it, you know. Um, I, you know, I'm really impressed with this. I mean, sometimes I'll go into the code review system and, you know, see this totally amazing feature and I'm like, yes, that's perfect. And it's, and it's so easy to get involved. I mean, anybody here can get involved. I mean, if you, if you see something that you don't like about your phone, you can just change it. I mean, you can just check out the code, start hacking, install it, and it does exactly what you want.
All right, so maybe I convinced you to use CM if you're not already. Um, so here's some resources that you can use. Um, Get.cm, that's where you can download CM. That's uh, the front end to our mirror network. If uh, you want to know if your device is supported, you can just go to get.cm and look in the sidebar, and you'll see code names. And more recently, you'll also see the actual name of your device. Um, and if it's there, then it's supported. <laughs> uh, we have a wiki. Um, there's tons of information there. Um, there's detailed instructions for building CM yourself, installing CM on your device. There's information about the project, how we work, how to contribute, and tons of other information about just sort of this general side of Android in general. Uh, we have a we have the forums, it's just simple forum.cyanogenmod.com. Um, there's thousands of people online at any given hour of the day. Um, it's really active. It's probably the best place to get to get help with uh, some issue that you're having with installing CM or maybe working on something, working on some feature. We also use GitHub. GitHub's awesome. Um, we have a we have an organization on there. Um, we have something like 440 projects on our GitHub organization, um, and you know it's kind of. If you load up github.com slash mod, you'll see um, an insane sidebar with a project list that goes on and on and on and on. Um, but every sub-project inside of Android is its own Git repository. And every device we support is its own Git repository. So there's a lot of stuff there. Um, some of it's dead, but um, the, probably 90% of it is all active. Now, our code's on GitHub. But don't send us a pull request because all you're going to get back is an automated response saying that we don't actually take pull requests. Um, now, as CM grew, we couldn't just merge code from somebody else's repository. Um, we needed to do a proper code review. We needed to we needed to decide on this stuff and you know dissect it. So we started using Garrett, and Garrett is. Um, Garrett is the same platform that AOSP uses for code review. Um, it's awesome. It's totally integrated with Git. Um, it's super easy to use. And we did a ton of docs on our wiki that will help you get set up with it if you so choose to use the system and contribute to us. And you can also find us on Freenode. So. Uh, sorry. Um, you can also find us on Freenode uh, if you want to uh, if, you, if 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 you want to track any of us down. Cyanogenmod dev. Um, we also have a general channel. Um, you know, it's mostly full of trolls, but at the same time, um, it's 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 a lot of fun. If you ever need help, you can you you can get some help there. All right. So one more thing. Um, so this morning. We released CM9 RC1. So we did the release for 37 devices. Um, and you know, it's a, we think it's a pretty good start. Um, there's probably at least 20 more that we're, we're aiming for by the final release, which will hopefully be in the next couple of weeks. Um, yeah, you know, he's laughing. It's, so it'll probably be the next six months, but you know, who knows. Um, <laughs> I mean, we, we, we really did put a lot of time and work into this, and I, I hope you guys like it if you check it out. So, and um, that's it. Um, that's all I have. So, uh, you know, we can, uh, we can do some Q&A, and you guys have some questions. Uh, I'm sure you do, so thanks. <laughs>